Hi, Corey. Hey, Peter. Worried I've got a target on my back. <laughs> Making sure I'm keeping my whistle clean around you. Oh, man, I'm, I'm way more cuddly in person. Dude, uh, Pacific Bitcoin was incredible. Congratulations. For Wasn't that fun? Dude, it was amazing. Yeah, you just had uh, Mark Moss in here, and he just left, and yeah, just like getting the boys back together. It was I haven't great. seen an adult since since the rap party on Saturday, so. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was great, great event, great speakers, uh, great vibe, good food. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't even get to see it all because we were obviously busy uh, yeah. promoting Bedford, but uh, congratulations, great event. Um, thank you for having me as part of it. When's the next one? Uh, we're going to do, we're shooting for the last week of September in 2023. We'll lock the dates uh, as soon as we lock down the venue. Okay. Um, obviously we want to do it at the same place. Yeah. But, uh, it's a great venue. Yeah. It really was pretty magical and amazing. Airplane hangar, jets outside, basketball court. <laughs> it was awesome. I think you crushed it and I look forward to next year. Now I know we've got a limited amount of time. So let's talk about how you have destroyed the Bitcoin price this year by taking down all these companies. Yeah, so. short-term pain for long-term <laughs> gain. Um, that's how I look at it. I think you know we should all be willing to uh, sacrifice a few weeks of Bitcoin price to uh, shine a light on all the scams going on in crypto. Maybe we get some cheap sats. Yeah, that's part of it. Um, I do need number to go up in the long run, though. I think otherwise, we, it can't be global money. Yeah, uh, and not to be broke. Because I get paid in Bitcoin, and that hasn't been the best decision over the last year. <laughs> but yes, we need number to go up. But listen, you've um, you've kind of been basically cutting the bullshit out of, out of everything, just holding everyone and everything to account, um, which has been impressive impressive to see because your hit rate is pretty high. I mean, I save my bullets for when there's influential ignorance uh, around something that I care about a lot. So I'm not. Not shitcoin PI. I don't care about some, you know, token number 60 that claims to be doing a bunch of stuff that's fake. Somebody else can work on that. But if it gets close to Bitcoin, starts to show up in my Twitter feed, if there's influential, you know, Bitcoin people or people who talk about Bitcoin a lot talking about something that's bullshit, uh, that usually catches my attention. And if I find it to not be true, I'm usually happy to tell people that I don't think it's true. So let's talk about FTX. Um, it's been quite the week. I mean, missed some of it because I was it's at your conference. It's two weeks now, amazingly. Well, yeah. 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 yeah, crazy. The Coindesk story hit 13 days ago was the, what started it. The speed of the collapse, I think, is what amazed so many people. <clears throat> yeah. How something can go from <clears throat> a notional value of 32 billion. It's like half a Luna. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but like in second, like it felt yeah, like seconds. So fast. It just, it was there and it was gone. Yeah, because it wasn't real. Yeah. Um, what was your take on it all? Like what do you think has gone on here? Because there is uh, the idea that you have basically some kids who don't know what they're fucking doing, controlling billions in value and trying to create a huge company and just don't don't have the experience to do something like that. I've run small companies and it's hard. Uh, yeah, companies like I had an advertising agency that turned over less than three million pounds, and that was hard. And mm -hmm. trying to get that to four million, like it's hard. Now you've got kids who've got controlling hundreds of millions of dollars, something that's worth billions, and they're completely out of their depth, and they just don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And then there's all this conspiracy shit. Well, nobody was calling him a kid until <coughs> last week, right? No, he true. He was a genius, and he was the next Warren Buffett, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And very few people were unwilling to go along with the manufactured PR narrative about this wonderkind MIT son of the Stanford law professor's genius. Uh, but he always just seemed like a weirdo to me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he is a bit of an odd character. Um, yeah. But... What's your take on it? Because there is all this conspiracy stuff. Like, you know, is is this like a deep state psyop? It's to bad bring enough regulation? without that. Like, yeah, you can of just use Occam's razor and just go straight to like the simplest explanation, and it actually all fits. And you don't even need to assume other nefarious actors coordinating anything. The actors would all do exactly what they have done, whether or not it was planned or coordinated. Hmm. Of right? course. Like 
his parents would leverage his money into fundraising efforts because that's what they do professionally. Uh, he would leverage connections from MIT because he went to MIT. Uh, you know, like I, there's nothing, you don't need to assume some sort of like omniscient actor behind things like this. Because the outcome's the same. It's the outcome's the same. So it doesn't really matter whether any of it was coordinated or not. Well, I, it's more of an interest, I, I guess, because if it's coordinated, it's very different to somebody just fucking up because it, it felt like a time, there at a time, they had the opportunity to build a big, I know crypto exchange and, yeah, but the, yeah, they had something that could certainly compete with Coinbase and Kraken and Gemini here mm-hmm. and, and potentially at some point compete with Binance. It felt like every trader who comes up in my feed was using FTX. So <laughs> we'll be fewer now. Well, they can't use it. they can't use it anymore. <laughs> a lot of those traders are gone too. <laughs> yeah, a lot of traders gone. A few funds have been hit. Yeah. Um, yeah, we saw the announcement from Travis Kling. You know, mm-hmm. whatever you think about him, Travis is a friend of mine. I've known him for yeah. a long time. And, he's, he's a friend of mine too. Yeah, and to I see, don't agree with his decisions in the last four years, but uh, he's still a nice guy. Yeah, he is, and and I'm sure he's been to hell and back over this last week. You know, we've seen we've seen a lot of that. But yeah, where, where do you think where do you think it went wrong? <sighs> from the beginning. Yeah. Tell me That's where you, it went wrong. From oh, the very oh, from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, from the very beginning. Um, so, yeah, there was a, a thread put out by uh, was it Jason Choi, Jason Choi yeah. this morning, which was just really illuminating and had a lot of screenshots from the early days. Uh, I actually think that I was in that crypto fundamentals Telegram group at the time and didn't pay any attention. So there were some screenshots from that one. I think I was still in it. Like I'd been in, in you know, 2018 or something, and I think I was still in it when those conversations were happening, but it was one of those ones that I didn't open anymore. I'd have to check. I actually don't know how I could check, but anyway, a lot of the names were familiar. But this was when, you know, people like uh, uh, Zushu and others were seeing the initial Alameda terms of their raise and 15%. being like, this is ridiculous. Like no equity for that first tranche, just a 15% clip and claiming that it was risk-free. And I mean, they weren't, they actually weren't the only one out there with the pitch at the same time. So I think in, uh, I remember in the first half of 2018, Amber, which is still around, but took a huge hit this year from a couple of things. I think they might be going under now, um, had the same pitch. It was like half a percent every month risk-free, you know, we just use bots and market make whatever, like, and it never is true. There is no such thing as 6% annual yield risk-free. There's always hiding some risk. So there's always a red flag when you say risk-free. Yes. From the jump. From the jump. Yeah. What do you think the impact's going to be on us? There's, you can spin a positive story that maybe there'll be less of this crypto shit. You can spin a negative story that we will see massive regulation. Mm-hmm. Is any regulation good or bad? I mean, I mean I, I'm a the big... The best thing is, honestly, like, Bitcoin is anti-fragile and the community itself being so decentralized is anti-fragile. Um, that's kind of the best thing about Bitcoin. And so the more events you can pack into a shorter amount of time, the better it is for Bitcoin. So these three kind of Mt. Goxes we've had in six months is a good thing? For Bitcoin? Absolutely. Uh-huh. Yeah. And are you surprised at what's happened to the price? Because if you'd have explained these stories to me beforehand, I would have said like the price would have gone to like five thousand dollars. I think we would have been yeah. screwed. Yeah, and it's held I mean, up quite well. It's it's held up quite well. I mean, I think everybody has that price memory of uh, of thirteen eight, and I'll start getting worried if it goes below there, maybe a little bit. Thirteen eight. Uh, why? That was that was the weekly close in December of twenty seventeen, and it was the high in uh, June of twenty nineteen. So it got right up to that weekly close, and then they were like, ah, that's enough, enough hype. Um, so, yeah, it's been always kind of hanging out there. Like, as long as we're like in the 15s, 16s, when people are freaking out on the weekend and you're back in the 16s, 17s, 18s during the week, like, I think we're fine. This feels like a bottom, but. You well, know. yeah, but I thought like before was a One bottom. One more big shoe to drop. You think or you know? No. I was, that was a preface. Okay. It was the initial clause of a sentence. One more big shoe to drop uh, could be ugly. If there is. If there is. Do you think there is? We'll see. I mean, there's a bunch of huge, fragile businesses out there that, <clears throat> that will collapse at some point. Um, it's just a matter of when. So Can they collapse without damage to Bitcoin in that they... Uh, no, sadly. 
it will always impact the price of Bitcoin when these crypto businesses collapse. Can you point to who you think? Uh, I mean, I think we've all been kind of speculating about crypto.com because they have, you know, a huge balance sheet that's mostly their own, you know, printed out of thin air token kind of sounds familiar, um, you know, and just kind of nobody trusts them because their backgrounds are like shady, scammy internet marketers. And, you know, so nobody really wants them to win and nobody will probably come to their aid if they get in trouble. Were they the ones who did the Monaco card or the Monaco? Do you remember that? I think so. I think think they might be mco yeah unless they're metal they're not i don't think they are i think you're right i think they're mco i think yeah. that was the monaco ico because they seem to explode at a certain point yeah and uh and then they launched their token they and they they seem to mirror a lot of what ftx has done in that a yeah lot of sports they're, sponsorship. they're interest i mean they're they're like a blend of ftx and celsius yeah because they you would see they're all over the f1 yeah, they sponsored which stadium? They sponsored. It's here, sadly. It's the Lakers Stadium okay. downtown LA. A lot of the MMA stuff. Yeah, they sponsor the UFC. Yeah. But I was told with the Lakers Stadium, the boost in the price of their token once they announced it paid for it. That's one of the rumors I heard. Well, it's dropped since then. Well, so yeah, it has now. It's yeah, been, it's been crashing hard. But they're still yeah. honoring withdrawals right now. So far, I mean, they've paused things here and there, but so far they've been able to keep it together. Uh, but I'll tell you. Uh, Do you want it to go? <laughs> yeah, I absolutely want crypto.com to fail. Yeah, for sure. I, I hope they go and blow themselves up and <laughs> never to be heard from again. <laughs> go on, you uh, heard? Oh, uh, I was just going to say, like, literally, the chances of them finishing out that 10 year deal in the, in the stadium downtown is like literally zero. Okay. No chance. All right. Um, has you, have you seen any change in trading volumes for Swan? This week, with regards to this, or has it not affected it? Uh, they go way up. They go way up. Yeah, when people can buy Bitcoin on sale, uh, they buy a lot. So, Swan, historically, we do way more users joining the platform and way more volume when the number's going up. We don't gain many users, but we do a lot more volume when the price is going down. And then when it's just like flat, that's what you don't want. <laughs> you just like you trickle users in, and like volume is just kind of low. It, it's, do you know what? It's exactly the same with the podcast. When really? the price is going up, we get loads more listeners and we get loads more downloads. Uh, when the price is dropping heavy, we will get more listens, not, but we don't get new users. Mm. When we go sideways, it's just yeah. like a slow decline. Yeah. I think ev- like, uh, everything is a derivative of Bitcoin. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, uh, yeah. Do you want to talk about A16Z? If you want to, sure. Well, so your crosshairs were on them this week. I mean, I've been calling them out for a couple of years now, at least. Uh, I think I just decided to do a thread on them because, well, because I have a little bit more, uh, a little bit more sway right now. And I think it was important that some journalists dig in and pay attention. So now there are a couple of reputable shops digging in, and I think we'll end up with some some long form magazine style. Uh, reports on their activities of the last four or five years? Maybe, because uh, I think some people might fear going after A16Z. Mm-hmm. I, somebody told me once when I was in San Francisco, it's career suicide to cri- criticize A16Z. Yeah, uh, for a startup founder in Silicon Valley or a wannabe VC, it's probably not the wisest choice. Yeah. Um, but it's good to be in an anti-fragile business that doesn't need them or their friends. But historically, good reputation yeah. yeah, good I investor. Mean, so listen, I mean, this is this is like part of my origin story, right? When I came into the space, you know, the crypto canon on A16Z, their newsletters, all this. I mean, I used to always read their shit. I like their, podcast. to their podcasts. Yeah. Um, you know, so that was Signal for me coming out of Silicon Valley startup land and then, you know, getting interested in Bitcoin and crypto with the last bull run in, in May of 2017. You know, I used to religiously read Fred Wilson's newsletter every time it hit my inbox. And, you know, he ended up doing, you know, Coinbase and uh, I think the Kit Ken was his big ICO back in 2017. If you remember that one, it was like God, a messenger no, that know. saved itself with a, oh, hold on. with a Hail Mary ICO. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. So that was, that was Union Square Ventures. <laughs> so these were the guys, you know, I, I used to, you know, work on startups with like, you know, marketplaces and SaaS companies and ad tech and video and 
you know, VR and stuff like this. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was hard because the signal that you were used to trusting was so wrong and so deceitful. And I actually, I mean, obviously this is an important point to make, like I don't actually care whether what somebody's intentions are. Like I just completely discard what they're saying. And that goes for Sam Bankman Fried, Alex Mashensky, Do Kwan, whatever. Uh, maybe that makes me cold or whatever, but I really don't care at all what they're saying. I'm just watching what they're doing. And I'm looking for the most rational explanation of why they're doing what they're doing. So, you know, if, if Luna Foundation and Jump are topping up the anchor reserve for UST so that people can keep on buying UST and they can clip this 20% coupon, that's an irrational thing to do unless they're making money on it. So how are they making money? Oh, wow. It seems like Luna is high beta to UST market cap. So the price of Luna goes up by more than the balance in UST. And so obviously they must be selling Luna into this pump. And so it's worth it for them to top this thing up by half a bill because they're selling $2 billion of Luna out the back door. Hmm. So that's really the formula over and over again. It's like if I see Mashensky a few days after the collapse of Luna going on an AMA on YouTube and saying, you know, uh, Bitcoin maximalists are responsible for people losing 30% of Bitcoin supply. You should instead send your Bitcoin to me because I'll keep it safe for you. I'm not listening to his words. I'm just saying like, oh, this dude is trying to gather deposits. Oh, he must have a hole. He must be paying out old investors with new investors deposits. Oh my God, that's a Ponzi scheme. It's going to collapse. Are you surprised by how many people are trying to, who are running Ponzi schemes knowing it's pretty harsh penalties at the end of it. Like someone like Mishinsky, my assumption is he ends up in jail. I don't know. I see a lot of pictures. I mean, Kyle Davies and uh, Shu Zhu or whatever, they're raising a new fund. Three Arrows mm-hmm. Capital guys. Re- Shut the fuck. Really? I found out this morning. Yeah, their plans are I saw a rumor on Twitter this morning. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're in Dubai. Nobody, nobody's touching them. But they're there's no extradition offshore. treaty, right? Yeah. So they just get to go and live next to all the disgraced people from 2017, 2018. And there's probably like one penthouse they all live in and they're probably in a polycure. And uh, that's a new word I learned this week. <laughs> but Mashinsky's in New York. Mashinsky's in New York, right? That's like public knowledge. Uh, I know he had a house there. I know he had a house in Austin at some point too, but, but why, sure. why are these people not getting arrested? It's a good question. I don't know. I think what they're doing is illegal. Mm. Well, back to A16Z. <laughs> Talk to me about that. And also, there's, there's quite a tight connection between them and multi-coin. Multi- they do a lot of the same trades, basically, and they both were long a lot of the different things that well, Sam Bankman-Fried was into the last few years. Yeah, When I interviewed... They were Carl- really like high-quality pump and dumps. Like, very inter- good chance to make some money. Carl Samani was like interview eight or something, wasn't he? Yeah, podcast. very, very early. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's why well, I was a crypto guy back then, and we had our time. And I'm pretty sure I interviewed him within the A16Z office. I think A16Z were one of their LPs. Could be. Yeah. Probably. A, I think there's a deep connection between the two. Yeah. I know for sure that uh, Kraft is a big LP for them. So David Sachs from the All In podcast, uh, they're a big LP for Multicoin. Um, hence the Solana thing. Yeah. So Kraft, Kraft's Solana position last fall was uh, over a billion dollars. I heard, we heard a rumor at the time that there was a moment in time where multi-coin capital was the best performing hedge fund in history. Yeah. Is that correct? Well, that's the rumor we heard. I don't know if it was yeah. true. Because basically their Solano position was like, was it like a 20 million investment that went to 2 billion? Or well, that was, it was the grade, like the, the most profitable trade in venture history or something. I'm not supporting it. Just saying that's that's what these people can do. Yeah. I mean, that wouldn't be as good as like, you know, Google returns for an early round investor in Google or something like that. Obviously. I think it was over the time period though, because it was maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well that's that's the whole point of crypto VC is short time to liquidity, right? That's huh. the whole point. Because you don't have to have product market fit. You don't need to have revenue validation of anything. You're literally just selling a pipe dream and dumping it on people's heads. So back to A sixteen Z. What it, what is it? What is it stands out for you and what do you want to happen here? Because like I agree that they have been funding a lot of crypto nonsense. Yeah. Uh, I used to love 
Chris Dixon. I used to I yep. used to listen to his pod, him on podcasts and read his Twitter. Me too. Before he joined Andreessen, yeah. By the way, but it's all fucking crypto metaverse nonsense now. Yeah. So what are you going for here? Well, it's probably the way that crypto has been allowed to exist in the United States over the last you know five years has been probably the best fit ever as an industry vertical for venture capitalists to make money. Because you can stack funds very, very quickly. If you can flatten out that J curve where you make your investments, it usually takes like four or five years for you to get back in the black. Yeah. You show that performance, then you raise fund two, fund three, whatever. So they've been able to stack these crypto funds very, very quickly. And you know they're already on fund four. I think it's 7.6 billion total across the four funds. Um, not to mention that, don't forget, they got, I forget, it was like 80 to 140 people registered as reps so that they could shill the hell out of these things back in 2018. What, why so, is it that they can do that so quick? Is it because of the time to liquidity? Yeah, right. It's a short time to liquidity. Okay. Yeah. So you only need two, two slides in uh, Ray's deck talking to LPs for, uh, for a crypto fund. First is short time to liquidity, which is like, we literally need no revenue, no product market fit, literally nothing. We could just create this thing, market the hell out of it, dump it on retail or dumb money that we market to that you know believes us or whatever. So that, that's the first one. The second one is uh, we can make our own weather. And I didn't make this up. This is something that I heard from all the crypto funds back in 2017, 2018. That's what they all talked about was we can make our own weather because they're not regulated as securities. You can say anything that you want. You can promise any blockchain crypto magic that you want. It can solve whatever problem you say it's going to solve. And there's no, you know, no truth in advertising, no securities laws, no nothing governing the space. And so it's just literally like the best magic scam machine in financial markets history. The funds they have now, uh, is the value ma mainly in illiquid tokens though? No, a lot of it's in equities too. Um, so they've done both. So, so they'll fund, uh, they'll buy a bunch of tokens, they'll buy a bunch of stock and in, in some of the crypto infrastructure platforms. But, uh, you know, a lot of it is like, you know, $300 million into Solana, which they did in uh, March or April of 2021 before pumping Solana through their entire network on all their shows for all their speakers using their connections because they were sort of like, you know, created in the model of CAA with Michael Ovitz. And so they have deep connections in Hollywood and they got everyone in Hollywood to like pump Solana all last summer and fall until they dumped. So they did dump? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Do we know how yeah. much they dumped? I don't. I don't know how much, but it would be ludicrous of them not to get out of like their cost basis plus some and maybe let some ride. But obviously they stopped pumping it basically after November. So, so talk me through the things that they have also done, invested in the things that stand out to you as a total scam. Uh, I mean, WorldCoin might be the worst yeah. project I've ever seen. Was that the thing with the weird sphere? Yeah. Oh, they yeah. scanned your iris or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's, But it's Bitcoin for the whole world. That was like six levels of evil wrapped up into one project, maybe the worst thing I've seen since Bology's companies of the last decade. Is it been, is it been, did they release WorldCoin? I don't know. Probably, probably dumped it on somebody. I don't know. Probably through FTX and Binance. I have no idea. See if it's, see if it's been traded. <laughs> See if the actual token exists. Because I remember it came out and everyone was like, ugh, gross. So gross. What the fuck is yeah. this? Like this is trying to say you're better than Bitcoin, but doing everything that Bitcoin isn't. Yeah, basically. Um, so there was that one. There was the, uh, the you know, wide area network uh, helium, oh, helium yeah. scam. That was, um, that was, was just a full on Ponzi scheme. That was multi-coin as well, right? Definitely. Was that the thing where the people so, bought the nodes actually. for like 20 grand or something? And made it, like it wasn't that much. It was, you know, probably 400 bucks or a thousand bucks or something like that. But they'd make but about seven bucks back. I think it was in the cents by oh, really? the end. Yeah. Like what, cents per month. What was Helium? What is Helium? Uh, it was an attempt to build like a, like a Wi Fi network uh, separate from. It was like a, you know, a distributed or decentralized Wi Fi network, basically. But. Nobody used it. It just didn't, I mean, it didn't generate any revenue. How and would so it generate? The, so all of the payouts to the early people were just coming from the device purchases and whatever subscription plans of the new people. That's the only way it was growing. And there was a token? Yeah. We got up the Helium token. HNT, baby. HNT. Yeah, Helium I remember Network the, token. I, I mean, the, the yeah. idea of the company is something that would be interesting. 
All right, so so <laughs> like every other chart. <laughs> this is every Andreessen chart right here. They all look exactly the Hold same. Hold on, where did that peak out at? $52. Where was it? Started out at 27 cents, $52, and now it's like... Two. Jesus. Yeah. It's still a 10X on when it launched, though. But the idea of having a decentralized Wi-Fi network, get rid of the token, it sounds like something that could be useful. Sure. Yeah, they fucked it up with a token. Do you think sometimes the token fucks it up because you destroy the incentive to actually build the company? Definitely. Like, I've already made Absolutely. my money. Yeah, if you want to ruin a company, add a token. <laughs> All right, what else have they done? Um, oh, you'd have to check my tweet thread, but... Uh, oh, here was, we go. You got the one about the... Uh, the decentralized staffing agency. <laughs> no, is that brain trust? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Total, now, so that's that's a much more <laughs> run of the mill. You know, that's the mode for Andreessen Horowitz is like the thing that doesn't need to be decentralized. <laughs> it's that scam. Is, is what there they a usually website run. for it? Yeah. What are they actually decentralizing? I don't know. Like, try running this. Like, who's making the website? Some DAO? No. <laughs> It's some company in Silicon Valley or something. Hold on, good, right? good. Brain Trust would change the way it works. Take ownership with the talent through the, through the Brain Trust token. Here, brain Trust gonna, is good. You guys all get this Brain Trust token. We're changing the Great. way work works for good. Brain Trust is controlled by you, the talent. It's, by the way, it's the always for good. Always. There's no always talent fees. In helping, the, helping the world, saving future the Future proof your every career. Time. I, don't get, I don't get it. Hold on. I literally don't understand what they're saying. It doesn't matter. Just check the token price. <laughs> but I also want to know what they're actually trying to... What is the message here? Brain trust is controlled by... Are they saying this is like a recruitment agency, but, but nobody works for it? I mean, that's what a decentralized, token-driven... Anyway, it's all just dumb. I know, but I, in like, some ways, I just want to understand. Can you go to the About Us section, Danny? It's just a way to pump and dump a token. That's it. The way we work is broken. In fact, it's been broken for a long time now. We'd hoped the advent of an online hiring marketplace would usher in a new era of work. Or a They're going to fix abundance. the economics. But the economics with their token. didn't pan out. That's few, usually yeah. what happens. I've never been on this website. This is atrocious. A few wealthy people became even wealthier, and the average worker is still scrambling to make a living. But we believe there's a better way to think about work a model that benefits talent and enterprise alike. A brain trust. Our decentralized talent network is built on the belief that everyone should be treated fairly. Fees should be transparent, incentives should be aligned, and a huge. This just sounds like. I liked this bollocks. better when it was the spring roll ICO back in uh, 2017, 2018. That was, that was way better. I. You remember that guy? Uh, they are the ones involved. Didn't science back them? Yeah, science backed them. Yeah, I put two Bitcoin into that. Oh, ouch. Yeah. <laughs> they turned into a lot of spring rolls. I got a load of spring rolls, and nice. uh, I've still got them probably on a fucking ledger somewhere. <laughs> I mean, I think what was Bitcoin back then? It was, pro, I don't know. In oh god, it's probably like ten k of it. No, no, because it would have been in the spring of eighteen I, or something. I think it was before I, before I did the podcast. You started the podcast late eighteen. That's November uh, late. Uh, late. We're two days away from November the seventeen. Yeah, two days away from the fifth anniversary. Yeah, I'm sorry to mess with your memory, but you bought those spring roll tokens in 2018. Did I? I thought it was before. There was no science blockchain yet. <laughs> it came in 2018. No, but I didn't have the... The thing is, I didn't have the... I don't think I had the podcast, or maybe I did. I don't know. Anyway, I, I know I put two Bitcoin into it. I I'm remember. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, what's the price of the token? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let's basically. move on. No, no, I, I honestly, like, I, I kind of want to move on from Andreessen anyway. Yeah, so. I, I honestly, I'll, I'll just sum it up by saying um, there are a bunch of crypto funds that operate similarly and worse. I think it's important to highlight Andreessen because they will have the most social pressure on them from their Silicon Valley compadres up there. And they will affect the most change very quickly and like back away from it. And I think it's like you can chop the head off and basically make all the cockroaches like scurry off into the dark if you can put enough pressure on the biggest, best known of all of them. That's why I'm targeting them. What, what is the best outcome for all of this? What do you want to see happen? Because I just want everybody to understand what Bitcoin is and what crypto is or is not and then make their own decisions. Do you think this crypto stuff should be regulated? Uh, 
I, am I know not, it's a tricky one. No, it's okay. I mean, I'm not pro-regulation. I am anti-hypocrisy. So if you've been in D.C. for the last 10, 15 years, banging the table for the deregulation of Ponzi schemes and shady MLM practices and saying, like, I want Stratton Oakmont to be able to send direct mail to the nursing home to make sure my grandma, you know, sends my inheritance into a scheme, some penny stocks or something. Like, if you've been really all about no regulations, you're a hardcore libertarian. There are Bitcoiners like this, by the way, that just say, get rid of all regulations, let the market figure it out. Totally fine if you're against all regulation. That's a principled stance. If you want regulation some places, but not other places, you're a fucking hypocrite, like Brian Armstrong at Coinbase. So Brian wants to benefit from the best regulated, most trusted, most liquid stock markets in the world here in the United States, where everyone around the world buys his stock, lines his pockets, lets him get a $135 million house a few miles over here. Uh, But meanwhile, with his left hand, wants you to just ignore the securities by definition, according to the laws on the books, since way before any of this shit came along, that are trading on his platform and doesn't want his exchange to be regulated as a securities exchange. So, I mean, you can have a principled stance and bang the table for all deregulation everywhere, or, you know, just well, don't we, be a hypocrite. I mean, we know what the SEC thinks of these things. We know the SEC thinks yeah. Bitcoin isn't a security. We know it kind of thinks Ethereum isn't, but some people argue it should be. We know something like Library, which by the way, I'm, I'm surprised it existed, is considered a security. Mm-hmm. So that's coming. Like all these tokens will be considered securities. Yeah. What is the implication for someone like Coinbase? Will they have to register as a securities exchange? Is that mm-hmm. is that all it means? Yeah, and well, they'd register as a securities exchange, but everything trading on the exchange from then on would have to be regulated as a security. Okay, and anything that isn't, they couldn't sell. Right. Okay. I mean that that would be a that would be a very quick, fast change if it happened. Yeah, it would be lights out for crypto. That would mean they only would be able to sell Bitcoin, maybe Litecoin, a mm-hmm. couple of things. Yeah. Which would be a massive, I'm just working through it. Be a it would be like pre Bology Coinbase before Bology got there and wrecked it. I mean, Bology's a friend of mine. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he did go in and create a fake framework with some corporate lawyers to say, hey, if you pass these criteria, you're decentralized enough. And then they're listing like universal pet token. Yeah, but at the time it was uh, it was Bitcoin, then it was Ethereum, Litecoin. then it was Litecoin, and then it was BSV, Bcash. Bcash, sorry. And it was yeah, just those, just four, those for, four for a long time. And then it just suddenly became everything. everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. And I understand there were competitive pressures because Binance yes. launched in 2017 and was eating their lunch and they were like, oh my God, we need to do something. Let's add all these shit coins. Well, that's exactly what you either do. One, you, can't, you can't be halfway there. Mm-hmm. You either have them all or you have yeah. none and you be Bitcoin only. Yep. And there, I, I'm guessing there's you running a Bitcoin only exchange that comes with different pressures. Yeah. I mean, we're not an exchange. So well, we're just okay, like a yeah. financial services company that one of the things we do is sell Bitcoin. So we're kind of a broker in that sense with that part of the business. Um, but yeah. But you compete with exchanges. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Although very few people who want to gamble in crypto would be attracted to Swan in the first place. Right. So okay. yeah, that's been kind of the magic of the whole business model is uh, if you're interested in crypto, usually you're just gambling with like, one percent or less of your net worth. If you're actually into Bitcoin, you tend the average person will go way deeper into their wallet and their net worth yeah. and buy a lot more Bitcoin. Don't tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm deep. Yeah, I mean, aren't, aren't we all? Most of your guests probably are. Um, okay, so back to the mission. Yep. Um, trying to help educate and communicate to people. Um, with the right regulation coming in, we could yep. end up just seeing Bitcoin actually dominate things again. Yeah, yeah. Which, oh, I think we should we should put the put the nail in the coffin there on that last thread though, okay. which is uh, you know basically the last couple of years, uh, what these big crypto exchanges and the big token projects have been trying to do is to wrest control oversight 
of their crypto securities from the SEC and put it under the CFTC. So that's been like the whisper campaign, like anything but the SEC. And of course, what's been dangled in front of the CFTC is we will gladly uh, allow you to charge us ridiculous fees if only you'll regulate us because we know you'll have a light touch and you'll let us all be called commodities instead of securities. So that's what they tried to do. That's why Bankman Freed or scam bankster fraud, as Bitcoiners like to call him, or oh, scam bank scam bankrupt? bankster fraud bankrupt, bankrupt is good. There's yeah. a lot of them. Yeah, it's pretty new. Um, it, it's almost to the point where his name is almost like maybe this is a psyop when we got trolled. What name should we give him? Let's give him scam bankrupt Freud. <laughs> oh, Freud. Okay, that's Freud, Freud. Sorry, Freud is that's Freud a slip right there. Yeah, Freud. Um, so you know, and they trotted him out there to DC a bunch of times. You know, trying to get this done and all the donations to the campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and obviously, you know, the Ethereum folks are down there all the time, and Coinbase sends their people all the time, and Andreessen sends Andreessen hires these people constantly as as GPs in their funds so they can get around the lobbyist rules. You can only be there for 20% of your time. Over that, you have to register as a lobbyist. So Coinbase just hires regulators and DC people as GPs so they can spend all their time in DC lobbying for this shit. That's where Katie Hahn came from. Yeah, she, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, but there's a, there was another. But she's launched. Hasn't there's, she launched her own? She launched her own 1.5 billion dollar fund. Uh, actually, have uh, an insider there that tipped me off. I'm talking to them tomorrow to see what's going on over there. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> that should be fun. Oh God. So what have they invested in? Do we even know what she's invested? In? I haven't been paying attention. I'm going to catch up tomorrow. Right. There might be a tweet thread at some point. <laughs> Danny, have you returned all your library books? <laughs> Corey's going to come for you. So it turns out, even though I graduated with a journalism degree and never practiced since graduating, uh, I ended up doing a little bit of journalism. Really? I didn't uh, know you were. Did, did you? Yeah, I went to University of Missouri, the or the first ever global journalism school. Why? Broadcast degree. Why did you do journalism? I was a local NBC TV reporter when I was 19. Is there any footage of that? <laughs> It's, have you ever seen that kid that says, uh, boom goes the dynamite? No. It's basically that. Some of your listeners will know it. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Is there footage of you? There, there are some beta tapes. Have you got any of it? That's Maybe. a yes. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, come on, send us some. I don't have a beta tape player, though. Sorry. Uh, and, so, and so, hold on, what did you do when you came out of uni? Why didn't you become a journalist? Uh, didn't enjoy it. Uh, I didn't enjoy TV. I figured like maybe later in life I'd do long form, you know, magazine or something like that. I might still do that someday and sit down with more time on my hands and write more. Um, I actually have my second article ever since starting Swan that I've actually written, like that I've cared about. I've done some like research stuff and stuff with uh, with Sam or, or Sam Callahan. But uh, Sam's great, by the he's way. He's amazing. Yeah, yeah. He's a superstar. Um, but yeah, basically an updated mission statement for Swan that is going out tomorrow, um, the race to avoid the war. Uh, well, well, this show's not going to come out tomorrow, so you can talk about it. We this. can talk about yeah, it. To- okay. Anyway, so we, to put the nail in the coffin, so yeah, yeah the CFTC thing, uh, it'll be really interesting what they do to kind of scramble the jets now that they've essentially lost their point man on that effort. Um, yeah, if you want to talk about yes. the race to avoid the war. So when we, I launched the company with a mission statement I wrote in February of 2020, which was 10 million Bitcoiners. Um, that was specifically about the effort, which is a global effort, but what really needed to happen or needs to happen is to get to that intransigent minority that Taleb writes about of 3 to 4% of the population in a society that will not bend on an issue, and that's all you need to flip a society, right? So this is why, like, almost the meat, almost all the meat in the UK is halal. Almost all the uh, CPG. Sorry, what? All, almost all the meat, like when you go to restaurants and shit in the UK, is halal prepared. Is that true? Yeah, they flipped it, man. At some point, there was just like more than more than four percent Muslim, and so they they bleed out the meat before they cook it. It's a very mildly noticeable difference. I think it's a London thing. Really? Can you? Anyway, might be apocryphal. Fact, fact check that. Yeah, fact okay. check so that one, that. Daddy. The other example is like here, like with uh, with kosher foods, like almost every can and almost every packaged good has like a little kosher symbol on it because, you know, that's an intransigent minority that demands that it be kosher and everybody else doesn't care enough. Right, okay. Right? 
So I this mean, idea the, the that meat is still good, so I don't care. But I'm exactly. just interested. No, it's, it's delicious. Yeah, yeah. I actually like it a little, a little drier, a little crispier. It's yeah. good. Um, so this idea that you would need in in the one place that really matters because it's the seat of power for the existing dollar and treasury based system that here where those decisions are made uh you would need to get to three or four percent of the population truly being down for the cause meaning uh, i just call it a bitcoiner the definition for this purpose is uh, have a decent chunk of your net worth in bitcoin so some skin in the game and understand it deeply enough that you would you know fight for it in your way you would evangelize with your family and family and friends you might go to a town hall and make life a little difficult for Brad Sherman, like whatever it is that you would do to, to help the cause that would, because it's very important to you. So it's yeah. kind of like that single issue voter would need to get to like 10 million Bitcoiners in the US. And- Where do you think we're at? Between 100 and 200,000 is okay. my guess. Wow. Yeah, so I think we need another 50 to 100X to get there. Um, and so that's that framework then is where, what's developed in my mind into this idea of the race to avoid the war. So if we win the adoption race, then we never have to fight the war, right? So there could be a dark period in the development of Bitcoin. I think the eventual domination of, you know, by Bitcoin of global money is inevitable. But if we win this race, it could happen as early as like 2035, 2040. If we lose, it could get really dark and it would have to go kind of, underground and build back up and it could be the 2100s before we get to enjoy you know this new era of growth and human prosperity and freedom that i think bitcoin will usher in i got a feeling we won't be around for that mate. we wouldn't be but mm. i think we can if we win if we win the race basically like the next you know 12 to 15 years then we'll never have to fight that war so this opposition can be converted to our side. So this is why it's like a multi-front race and everything that you do for Bitcoin, whether that's pushing adoption like we do, whether it's building you know, great privacy tech, whether it's building you know, better custody solutions like Spectre Labs, whether it's uh, pushing nation state adoption like Jan3 or anybody working down in El Salvador, whatever it is that you can help make Bitcoin run faster or make Bitcoin and Bitcoiners look less assailable and less attractive to attack where it looks unwinnable to fuck with Bitcoin and Bitcoiners, whatever you can do, you're helping us run faster and or helping the other guys run slower. Mm. And so that, that group contra Bitcoin or contra Bitcoiners uh, hasn't coalesced, but could. And we're trying to make sure that they never coalesce. And I think the natural, you know, triumvirate of shit coinery basically is probably like government, banks, and crypto, non-Bitcoin crypto. And so those are the three, the three groups that we have to either uh, infiltrate and convince to come over or just crush. Do you think there's an argument to bend principles on regulation for the benefit of Bitcoin in that Traditionally, Bitcoiners aren't pro-regulation. They want the markets to figure it out. But at the same time, if you could regulate away all these shit coins and then only have Bitcoin to focus on, that you win the race to avoid the war. Do you think mm -hmm. there is an argument for that? Do you think it's a hypocrisy and you shouldn't do that? I mean, I think I answered it already. Like, I think you should either be banging the table all the time for no regulation and get rid of all regulations, yeah. penny stocks, you know, all the rules and regulations around banking and securities, you should get rid of everything, or you should at least be fair and regulate everything the same. Mm. So you just can't have it both ways. By the way, did you, is, is Spectre Labs the thing I've read that you bought? Yeah, yeah, so we Spectre Solutions, that's yeah. more it's Wiedersheim's company. Um, so yeah, the whole team came over a few months ago, they're part of Swan and we're building awesome multi-custody solutions with them. Uh, all the free open source software stuff stays the same and they're still working with lots of other companies and things like that, but we're we're leveraging their expertise and some of their solutions to build cool shit for our customers. Is that your first acquisition? Yeah, yeah, first one. That's nice, man. Yeah, yeah. very exciting. I didn't know about that and, and until yesterday, someone was in a thread giving you some shit about something and somebody replies like, 
No, dude, they bought Spectre Labs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that person deleted all their tweets as usual. Whenever they come spar with me, they just delete their tweets. Oh, was that, the, was that Pomp? Yeah. I didn't even realize that was Pomp. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Um, he always okay. comes out firing, pops off some blanks, and then deletes his tweets. Yeah, I mean, again, it's really hard for me because, like, I, I build friendships with these people, and I, do, I can't just not be someone's friend just because I disagree. With, like Nick Carter yeah. is my friend. I disagree with him on some of his crypto stuff, but he's still my friend. Mm-hmm. I can't just, like, discard these people from my life. It's a weird thing. I hear you. Yeah, I mean, I used to be friends with Pomp. I discarded him. <laughs> 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 I haven't been friends with Nick before. Uh, yeah, it's tough. well, I think the other thing is the, the job I do, I just, you know, build a lot of friends. But I think based on what you're saying, the race to avoid the war, I think that... That's, I, this is interesting to tease out though, right? Yeah, go because on. I'm not in the media, yeah. technically, but I also run a media company. Yeah, so... It, <laughs> so I, I'm a for you have some things that you can do that I can't. Like what? And I have some things that I can do that you can't, which is interesting. I guess, so what you can do that I can't, I need to be careful of some of my public statements because, um, you know, if you get a reputation of just being an ass, no one's going to come on your show, Mm -hmm. which is true. Um, What can I do that you can't? Um, I think you can, well, I mean, first of all, it's like obviously easier to get sponsors if you're a neutral party, so you can pay for more things than we can. We have to kind of come out of pocket for more of it. Um, So you can get bigger and produce like better media, I guess, than, than we could, unless we're subsidizing it, which we do. <laughs> yeah. I think there's another thing to that though. Like I, there's a, there's just the time I've been doing it as well, you know? Totally. Yeah. yeah. And I always think an independence media is always got an advantage over one, which is corporate led. I actually think you've done really well as a corporate podcast, but when anyone comes to me, when I see one, like one of my sponsors, they say they're launching a podcast. I'm like, why the fuck are you launching a podcast? Yeah. Like, what have you? What have you? What have you got that's new and interesting that's coming with a corporate message? Like we're just independent guys yeah. figuring this shit out. Me and Danny and Jeremy and yeah. Emma now just traveling and figuring that out. I think I think you did a really good job with um, Swan Signal. Yeah, Swan Signal's a great show. I love you, that show. You, but you did a thing where you just paired up good people. Yeah. And it just became a thing. It's like, okay, oh, you've got Lynn and Preston or whoever it yeah. would be together, and it's. You know, it kind of makes sense, but it is all. It will always be a corporate podcast. Maybe. I mean, it. It's interesting. I mean, a lot of times I think we're just a media company that happens to have a lot of Bitcoin services. I don't. I don't. I don't think you're there yet, but you could be. It's. I, I think it's you're. Interesting. I think you're a. I mean, I can. I consider you exchange because you're a compete with exchanges. I know you're not exchange. I know you can't sell with Swan. I still consider you a Bitcoin services company who does media. Yeah, if you were saying like manufactures farm equipment or a crypto exchange, then we're a crypto exchange. Yeah, <laughs> no, but it's it's more like who, who? What's the buckets of competition I put you in with? But at the same time, yeah, like, like an on ramp. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I'd, I'd say if you were like new to the space and you were an analyst, you know, you would put us there with Celsius and Coinbase and everybody else. Well, I think what you do is like, where do I get my Bitcoin? You're in the buckets yeah. of where do I get my Bitcoin from? And that could yeah. be Coinbase, that could be, you know, Swan, that could be Kraken, that could be yep. Binance. So I put you in that bucket, but like I know a bit more about the business now, but I still think you're that and you do media. Yeah. And I, th- I think that's a better place to be. It is. No, I mean, I, I think this, this goes back to, uh, you know, how do you control, how do you control your pipeline of new customers and how do you, how do you sort of, have full control over your cost of acquisition, I guess, right? Because yeah. if you have to pay Facebook and Google and try to win auctions on display networks and you're going up against crypto casinos that are just printing money out of thin air or completely faking it the whole time. I mean, FTX was just offering 5 to 8% yields just to get deposits in that they could send over to Alameda to gamble with. Like, I can't compete with that because they yeah. can offer, you know, 200 bucks when you sign up for an account, those economics don't work if you're actually honest. But low time preference means you're still in business and they're not. Yeah, and yeah. You keep going, you build trust, Absolutely. reputation. Like we can't advertise growth of a podcast. Yeah, you know, we could take out some ads. A couple of people might try and listen. We tried it with Defiance. It just doesn't really work. It's just mm-hmm. consistency. Turn yeah. up consistent. Turn yeah. up consistent. That's what you. And I think you're kind of in that space as well where it's turned up and be consistent. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's there's a lot to be said for it. And it does have that kind of trajectory of of a uh of a show or a podcast or a media brand to some degree. Um 
you don't get a lot of turnover and you mostly are just sort of like growing, growing, growing. Uh, it's very sort of 37 signals base camp. Like yeah. if you come from the tech world, I remember that. Um, yeah, I, uh, I've known those guys since, I don't know, 20 years ago when I first got to Chicago is probably when I met Jason. And then Dave and I were like social friends for a number of years. And, uh, one of my best friends who actually, uh, officiated my wedding, uh, Matt Ruby is a writer and comedian out in New York and he was actually their author, their first employee, uh, going way, way back. And he wrote Signal versus Noise for like the first eight years. He wrote Rework for them and one of their other New York Times bestsellers. So uh, he was our first writer at Swan. And obviously I've been talking to him about, you know, their their DNA and their operating system for 20 years. So it's been kind of interesting to see that apply a little bit. Well, we, when I had my advertising agency, we used Basecamp. So we used mm-hmm. all their software and uh, I've always liked them. Is Dave the one who's kind of he did the Le Mans, he's, he's, the yeah. race car driver. Yeah. No, no, no. It's not something I'm thinking of. Who's the guy who there who was anti Bitcoin? He's now Bitcoin. That's Dave. Yeah, it's Dave. Yeah, yeah. He finally got it. We yeah. argued a lot. Yeah. So he he's he he's in Europe because um, he's he's Danish. Yeah. yeah. He did live in Malibu for a number of years, but he went back. So he was fully against Bitcoin, right? Mm-hmm. And I've seen him come. Th- Full circle, but I think he came full circle because of the app store. He realized mm-hmm. the problems with centralization. Yeah. Like he was getting his butt kicked by Apple. Yep. It was the launch of Hey, the yeah. email uh, application that brought him around. Yeah. I just, that was nice to see. But but going back to your race, race to avoid the war, do you yep. see that as a rally the troops for Swan or rally the troops? Everyone. For everyone. everyone. That's what, that's what, the Pacific Bitcoin conference is about, which is obviously like we own it and do all the damn work, but it's not even really supposed to make money. It's just like every year we're going to basically spend as much on it as we've taken in. So however many sponsors come and however many tickets we've sold, that's how much money we're spending on the conference. Right. Okay. At least that's the plan. I mean, maybe someday there'll be, you know, smarter people that say, Hey, that's a revenue <laughs> generating product. We should do better. But that was the plan this year, and it's the plan for next year. So this is a rallying cry. Yes. So what do we do? What do me and Danny do? You guys are pushing adoption. How do we do it better? Um, no, I think it's fine. Should I mean, we spend I think, all our income on like making more shows? <laughs> I mean, I think. I don't know. I don't. I th- I think that all the major Bitcoin podcasts kind of have their place, and I. You would have heard from me already if I had a gripe. Well, I do hear from you when you, when you have a gripe. Let's be honest. <laughs> you do sometimes hear from me occasionally. Yeah, well, I'm okay with happens. that. Like, I think yeah. I think we've so- talked we've talked it out, and we've we've actually ended up agreeing about half the time. Yeah, and of what's left, I'd say like a quarter of the time, you're like, I just can't do anything about that one. Yeah, for now. Yeah, and then a quarter of the time, you've been like, thanks for the input, Corey. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, no, but I think I think a quarter, that quarter of the time you're also look, I, you're like, okay, I get it, I get where you're at with this. Yeah. Um, but I, for people who don't know, like me and Corey speak a lot on Telegram, and like, you know, I care deeply about what I'm doing and the importance of it. And I will come to you and say, Corey, look, I've got this yeah. issue. What do you think I should do? And I got that issue. I'm also part of it is just like protecting myself from the Corey target coming on my back. <laughs> you have two X's on your chest, though. So <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think what happened is like six months ago, I realized I should put you in my uh, my media folder on Telegram, which is where I feed all the journalists uh, story angles and things yeah. that I'm trying to get out. Um, it's and useful. So I just started including you on a lot of those, and that ended up sparking a lot of conversations for us. Yeah, it's useful, man. So th- this race to win the war, what what is what is the rallying cry though? What are you saying? Um, I mean, I still think the most important thing, the most important single number that matters is still that 10 million Bitcoiners in the United States. Um, But if you are pushing Bitcoin adoption in El Salvador or the Congo or building privacy tech in Czechoslovakia or Canada, you're still giving us more time to get to 10 million. So if you're pushing adoption somewhere else, you're making adoption look more likely here in the US and like more attractive. And then if you're pushing something that makes Bitcoin harder to uh, attack, then you're giving us a little bit more time to win the race. Okay. So it's basically, it's a global fight, but really the only thing that matters is flipping the United States because the only entity that could coordinate a meaningful 
effort contra Bitcoin is the U.S. government. So what do you think? Like of, literally nothing else matters. Yeah. And I don't ever want them to be an adversary. I want to just infiltrate them and convert them. Yeah. So what do you think about the idea that, say, like Dennis Porter is, you know, love him or hate him. I think he's a lovely guy. Uh, he is going around and actively trying to recruit politicians. Other people would say, stop fucking kissing politicians' ass, forget about them. What do you think should be done? I mean, a politician is just a person, Yeah. right? I want to convert 8 billion people into Bitcoin. So. But, it's an, but it's a person that has influence over mm-hmm. this. Like, for example, we're, we're, well, actually, you know, I'm going to Austin this week and I'm interviewing mm-hmm. Ted Cruz. What would you want to ask him? What would you say to him? Boy, that's a whole different question than what you just started off asking about. Yeah, I, was, I was prepping my answer to the first one. Do the first one. Um, yeah, we'll do a tweet thread on the cruise thing. Um, yeah, I think I think all all efforts that are like well executed in favor of Bitcoin adoption are good. Um, well executed is doing a lot of the lifting there. You know, so I think it's uh, it's probably net negative for Bitcoin messaging to get included in like a coin center platform for the most part. Um, I think a lot of us realized that the crypto blockchain lobby groups were very willing to throw Bitcoin under the bus and fuck us over uh, when the uh, infrastructure bill was going down in 2021. Okay. And that very quickly sparked uh the need, the obvious need to create a bunch of Bitcoin only policy groups. So you got BPI BPI, and SAT Center and OpenSATs. I think there's two more, Um, you know, because those are absolutely necessary because, you know, crypto blockchain, DeFi, crypto scambo, like that was not ever going to promote true things about Bitcoin. It was always going to muddy the water with crypto innovation. Um, In terms of the mission, and in terms of trying to recruit people, what do you think works? What do you, what do you, because like people say, come for the number go up, stay for the revolution. I've been, I talked to um, Brandon the other day, we had Brandon Quidham in, yep. and I said to him, I've stopped explaining Bitcoin like an investment to people now. Even on our football club website, it says um, uh, why you should not buy Bitcoin. Hmm. And it's like meant to lead people in, it says to them, you, you should learn about Bitcoin. And I'm trying to get people to the ideas like, just trying to buy Bitcoin to make money now and quickly is dangerous. Yeah. You know, if you want to buy some for long long term, great. But either way, if you agree with Bitcoin, like if you understand the mission, you agree with it, you should get behind the revolution. So either way, just go and buy a hundred pounds worth. Just mm-hmm. just get in, get involved and understand it. That's that's what I'm trying. Brandon, by the way, completely disagreed with me. Hmm. He said, no, number go up is powerful. And I get it, it is, but number go down isn't great either. What do you think? What do you think works? I mean, there's three variables here. There's the messenger and there's the message and there's the recipient. And so that that can mean a lot of different things. So Mm. Brandon's pitch might be very effective the way that he does it. And you have what Bitcoin did, which is kind of a mind fuck. It's like, well, did it do it already? Is it going to do it? I'm so confused. Where am I in time and space? And so, of course, you would have, you know, don't buy Bitcoin on your website. Such, no, that's on the football club website. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like, you've got a good uh, an ad man's tagline way of pitching things. Um, I feel like the, I feel like the at least a plurality of the people that have been trying to educate about Bitcoin for the longest generally settle into like uh, chapter one is you know what is money, you know like help people understand that. And that's kind of like the the best entry point if you have someone who trusts you and is willing to sit down and talk to it a little bit, um, talk to you about it for a little bit. So I feel like that's where, you know, Lavera will start there. Um, Jan will usually start there. People like that that have been doing it for a long time, I feel like they usually start to attack your conception of, of what is money. And then that gets into Bitcoin eventually. Um, I obviously try to reach, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And I also come from, you know, noticing that 95% of people don't get it the first time around. Everybody has, you know, one swing, two swings, seven swings, 10 swings, whatever your embarrassing story is like mine uh, of not getting it the first few times and then finally getting it. Um, 
so I think it's important to hit people with multiple different messages and to hit them with the same message multiple times and, uh, you know, really treat it like, uh, like a sophisticated marketing effort, really. Mm. Well, listen, I know we uh, had a time limit. Um, wh- where do you want to send people? What do you want to tell them? Uh, well, if you've heard any of the buzz about the Pacific Bitcoin conference, uh, we just put a block of tickets on sale for next year. Buy them. Uh, you should definitely come out. Definitely it's going to be come. amazing. So PacificBitcoin2023.com has those heavily discounted tickets for next year. Full refund till July 1. So you can just grab the tickets now on discount. You can sell them for more later if you want to, if you don't come, or you can just get a refund from us. So it's kind of like a, a free call option there. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's important for us to let anyone in your audience know that we successfully launched Swan Advisor Services a couple of months ago. Is what I've been working on with Andy Edstrom for the last year and a half. Nice. Uh, Ryan Flynn kind of made his debut on the big stage uh, at Pacific Bitcoin. So he's kind of like the, the day-to-day point man there. Um, it's going incredibly well, uh, it's like a rocket ship out of the gate, bunch of big registered investment advisors and financial advisors on the platform getting Bitcoin into the accounts of their clients. Um, so if you're a, you know, a money manager and you have clients that you want to get exposure to Bitcoin and you still want it to be part of their part of the portfolio that you manage instead of sending it off platform to Coinbase or something like that. Um, Swan is the only Bitcoin only option in the world for that, for, uh, for US money managers. Nice. Well, listen, keep crushing it. We're looking forward to coming back next September for Pacific Bitcoin 2023. We'll be joining you. I think it was amazing. I keep saying it over and over again. All the team loved it. I know you'll crush it. Any idea what kind of numbers you're going for? What do you want to hit? Um, I think probably like 2,000 to 2,500 for next year seems about right. I don't want to go too much bigger than that. Let's just see how that feels. Well, we will be be there, Corey. Uh, Keep doing your thing. Keep crushing. And thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks, Pete.